So uh, I, I would like to do an exercise. Uh, so uh, exercise L1. Uh, everybody knows what is this space. This is a Banach space, okay? But it doesn't matter here that uh, it is a Banach space that, that because the, the exercise is that this is not Hilbert space. So remember that uh, we have this interesting characterization. So if we have two points x and y, we have that the length square of x plus the length square of y in a, hill, in a space coming from a scalar product uh, uh, satisfies the parallelogram identity. So we have this equality, remember? And this characterizes a norm coming from a scalar product, okay? Therefore, we can use this, uh, this assertion that this is a characterization of the norms coming from a scalar product to prove that this is not Hilbert, namely that the L1 norm does not come from a scalar product, okay? To prove this, it is enough to show to show that the L1 norm does not come from a scalar product. It is sufficient to prove that the parallelogram identity does not hold. Okay. Just one comment, uh, not related to the exercise, but just to, L, to the L1 norm. So what is the L1 norm in R2 now? Just to have in R2 and not in L1, in R2. What, what is the L1 norm in R2? Just finite dimension. The vector, if I have a vector in R2, which is the L1 norm. It's modulus of x1 plus modulus. It is modulus of x1 plus modulus of x2. And which is the unit ball? This is square. Uh, Not exactly. Yeah, from. exactly. You see? This is the unit ball of the L1 norm, OK? Just to have some intuition, okay, the unit ball of the L2 norm, it is clearly the standard uh, round circle. Hmm? So this is L2, in finite dimension, by the way. Eh? This is L1, this is L2, and L infinity, what is the L infinity norm? Huh? This is the L infinity norm. Okay, so the smallest object there is the L1. Uh, then there is uh, the, the L2, the L, the L um, infinity. In between, there are all convex objects called LP. Mm -hmm. is in between. 
uh, and note that if this is contain if one of these convex now by the way it is clear that one it is strictly convex and the other two in this picture are not okay okay this is clear uh, this we are in finite dimension eh? um, if you have another remark maybe is this if take this uh, rhomb rhombic object and then take uh, one of the other two so the rhomb, the rhomb is contained in one of the other two. What does it mean in terms of the norms? Which is the higher? The one corresponding to the smallest or the one corresponding to the large? Which is the, the, the fact that one is inside the other says something about the two norms, saying that one norm is larger than the other. OK? So the question is, if this set is contained in this circle, which is the larger? Hmm? I think that L1 should be larger than L2, for example. Yes. Well, you have to think the, this, this picture. Over the rhomb, you have a linear, one homogeneous function, hmm? right? Which is the norm. What is the norm? It's something that if you cut at different heights, you always find the same convex rescaled set. Hmm? So you have a rhomb, smaller rhomb, and then bigger rhomb. And then you are linear. So this is the graph of your L1 norm. Clear? Because the, the norm is one homogeneous and is identified by the unit ball. Once you know the unit ball, you know the norm by, by the homogeneity. So you have this convex set, then you rescale it or enlarge in a linear way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what you see is when you cut, you always, say this, see, you always see the same convex set, but with different scaling. Not only this, but the, the, the function is linear. OK? Now you have another object, which is larger. So this means that the, the, the function is smaller, because when you cut, you have a larger set. Hmm? You have to think about two cones, one inside the other. You have one cone, another <laughs> cone, you cut. Well, this slice is larger than this slice, but this was higher function than this. Hmm? This cone, of course, is a standard cone with uh, sections with, which are circles. This is not so standard because the sections are squares rotated. Okay. Is it clear? Okay. Well, this is just to have some intuition about the relation between the unit ball and the norm. Okay. Unfortunately, here we are in infinite dimension, so we cannot really do. Of course, we can suspect that L1 and L infinity will have some strange behavior. Just because these two norms in finite dimension are non strictly convex, have flat <coughs> portions in the unit ball, this could be a source of difficulties in the infinite dimensional case. And indeed, uh, uh, there are problems of reflexivity and so on uh, for an infinity, it's, uh, and one, etc. But this is, we will see. So uh, now, uh, so we have just to prove that the um, parallelogram, parallelogram identity is not true. And this will be sufficient to show that this is not Hilbert because we have a characterization. Okay. Remember that the characterization was proven showing that if this is true, then there is this function A of x and y, which is a scalar product. Which, that proof was not so easy. Remember? OK. Now. Uh, so we have just to exhibit two elements, x and y, in L1. Um, 
So let me call them, say, f equal the characteristic function of the interval 0, 1 half. So this is the function which is uh, the graph of f is this. OK, 1 half, 1. This is the graph of f. Namely, it is 1 where, so the characteristic function of a set is 1 if x belongs to the set and 0 if x does not belong to the set. Okay, this is called characteristic function. Maybe sometimes it's called indica indicator function, but these words, I mean, we have always to be careful because sometimes the indicator function is something which is plus infinity if x is in, and, and zero. So now let, let us call this characteristic function. So we agree that with the word characteristic, we mean a function with two values only, one and zero, in the set and outside. This is characteristic function, OK? Characteristic function of 1, so of, of A. So now, um, take, take also G equal the characteristic function of 1 half 1. Hmm? So let us compute now the uh, norm of f, the norm of f, the norm square of f. What's all i? Sorry? What wants to be proved? We want to prove that this is not true. For the one? <coughs> For the one. Huh? Well, but we have to show just, if you put here the L1 norm, then you want to show that this is false. This is the, the standard form of the parallelogram identity. OK, so let, let us try to show this. So the L1 norm of f. Well, it is, uh, I mean, huh? One over four. Okay. Hmm? Now, what is G? Well, G is this. Hmm? And it has the same norm. Okay. This, uh, of course, this is the L1 norm. Eh? This is the L1 norm. OK? It's the L1 norm or just the one norm? Well, the one norm is, the, is the no, in, in, in R2, in finite dimension. L1 norm is this. OK? This is a, an infinite dimensional, this is a norm on an infinite dimensional space. This is a norm on R2. I mean, of course, this is a sort of generalization of this, but there is a big difference between the two. Okay? The difference between the finite dimension and the infinite dimension. Now, what is the the L1 norm square of this. Do you agree? It is 1, because the sum of f plus g is 1. And I have to integrate 1 between 0 and 1, which is 1. Now, which is the... Uh, uh, OK, which is the, this, see, also 1. 
because when you take the absolute value, now f minus g is something like that. Huh? But when we take the absolute value, we don't see this problem of sign. So it becomes 1. So this implies that uh, 1, 4 uh, plus 1, 4, which is 1 half, cannot be equal to 1. So this is actually is equal to 1 half. And this is equal 1 half, 1 plus 1, which is 1. OK. OK. So this is the first exercise. Ah, maybe another exercise, sorry. Uh, another exercise, well, I don't find it, but it's very simple. I mean, the, the, the other, maybe this is home. Uh, C0, continuous functions, uh, continuous functions. with the L2 norm. So if I put the L2 norm on this space, this is not Hilbert, is not complete. Therefore, this is an example of space with an inner product which is not complete. OK? Infinite dimensions. Uh, it's not difficult. You can find a sequence of, well, the hint is that uh, you, if you take a continuous function, say, which is minus 1, or if you take This function here, where here, say this is 1 over n, this is 1. This. So you have a continuous piecewise linear, continuous functions like this. This is an element here. Uh, and this converges in L2 to a function which is discontinuous. So it is not in the space. Uh, because it converges to a function which jumps. So it is outside this space. Okay. Well, this is a hint. Try to prove by yourself. OK. Another remark related to the discussion of yesterday is the following. is the following. Um, so yesterday, we have constructed, say, so consider the ball of radius 0 in L2, small L2. And we have seen that uh, we have constructed, I think, uh, k. I don't remember the symbols. OK, maybe 0 if k is different from n and r over 2 if k is equal to n. I think we have constructed something like this. Hmm? And what we have seen is that the distance between yn and ym was always equal to uh, r over square root of 2. Hmm? So we have, say, uh, an element here. Of course, this is difficult to. And another element here. And so on for any di infinite directions. So first direction, second direction, third direction, etc., etc. 
there are infinitely many. But the distance between in L2 between these two, so this is a sequence. Huh? This is another sequence. And, but the distance between these is, is always constant. Hmm? This is what we, and, and everything is inside a big ball. Everything happens inside a big ball. So every big ball, one direction, R over 2. Another axis, R over 2. Another axis, R over 2. Another axis, R over 2. But we have infinitely many axes. Hmm? Everything is inside the ball. Now, the, the, the claim is that now consider a ball centered at one of those, say B, centered at one of those, Yn, generic, of radius r over 2 square root of 2. So now I, was, I would like to know, first of all, whether this is really contained in BR. Okay? So take a point, uh, so let me call it uh, Z, a point into a generic one of those balls, and then I want to measure the distance from the center. So the center was X, huh? okay? Yesterday, maybe yesterday, sorry, yesterday, well, it is easier to do for x equal to origin, but maybe yesterday was x. Well, okay, this was x. This was x uh, k. And this and this was x k plus. Uh, so just the translation of the previous one. Okay. X n x n. Okay. This this was yesterday. This was yesterday. Okay. Now, the distance from a point Z, I want to measure the distance from Z to the center. Now the center is X. So the distance, now we have the triangular property of the distance. And this is the center, uh, Yn. Huh? So this is less than or equal than the distance uh, of Z from Yn plus the distance from yn to x, which, was, which is r over 2. Okay, And this is, uh, by definition of the radius, is less than, so this is the distance. Um, sorry, I, I'm maybe jumping some. OK, less than uh, z yn yn x, so which is less than or equal than the distance z yn plus r over 2. And then this is less than or equal than the distance uh, of z from z between z and yn is, by definition, less than, uh, is less than um, uh, this, which is less than r. OK? So that we have really this picture. Now the point is, is it true that these balls are disjoint one each other? OK, so the, the problem is, is it true that uh, B R 2 square root of 2 Yn intersection B uh, R 2 square root of 2 Ym is empty? provided this. Is it true? Now, uh, so uh, let, me, let me draw, assume we are in this condition. So take a point in, assume that we are in this condition. Take a point in the intersection. OK, let me call it, uh, let me call it Z. Set. So B R square root of two Yn intersection B 
a to square root of 2 y n. Uh, let me compute the distance between y n and y n. So I have a point z here. Now I have y m and and y n. So now what can I do? Again, the triangular property of the distance. So the distance between this and this is less than the distance between this and this. So plus, so the distance between y n z plus the distance between y. OK. And then uh, we know that this is strictly less Uh, so uh, r over 2 square root of 2 plus r over 2 square root of 2. OK. OK. And uh, this is r over square root of 2, which contradicts since there is a strict inequality, the walls are open. This is a strict inequality. It's a contradiction with this. OK? So at the end, uh, the problem that we find here, which is a really a um, basic problem, is that inside a fixed ball centered at the point in L2, we can choose a countable number, <coughs> countable many disjoint balls of the same radius inside. That is the problem. So geometrically, we have, uh, now I cannot draw, but inside the ball of fixed radius, there are countably many disjoint balls of the same, of the constant positive radius. Is, is it clear, this statement? So Br x contains con, contains a countable set of, of pairwise disjoint balls of radius r over the square root of 2. OK. And we have already observed that the centers of this ball are a sequence which, is, which has no converging subsequences. No? So you have, you, you have this many balls the centers, and this has no converging subsequence. And this is the problem of the strong topology in L2. Uh, but this remark is, is, is curious, because now, now I, I'm saying something which is not related to the, strictly related to the, to the, to the, to the program. But, but it is a remark that maybe can be of interest uh, is the following. Now assume that you have a sort of Lebesgue measure on small L2. Hmm? I don't say what is a Lebesgue measure now, but assume that I have a something like a set function, positive, non negative set function, which measures at least the Borel set. So Take, take a set function, which measures the Borel set of L2. Assume that uh, reasonably that uh, mu uh, of a ball, of any ball, is finite. So this measure, like the Lebesgue measure, if you have a bounded set, this is a finite volume, reasonable. What is, so first of all, it gives a volume to any Borel set. 
non-negative volume. It gives a finite volume to a bounded set. This is reasonable. Hmm? What is also reasonable is that uh, um, it is countably additive. What does it mean? If I take a, a union of this countable union of disjoint Borel sets, I measure the volume. The volume is the sum, is the infinite sum of the volumes of all sets if they are disjoint. Okay? Well, and assume also that uh, mu is translation invariant. So mu translation invariant means that you have a, if you have a volume of a set, you translate by a vector. Then the volume of a translate set is the same as the previous one. Hmm? So for any Borel set A, for any vector X, assume this. Now, so this, these are properties that, that are all satisfied by the Lebesgue measure, at least on the Borel sets in Rn, in finite dimension. I don't require to have such those properties on all sets. But if I require just to have only on Borel sets, this is possible in finite dimension. Do you know this? No? OK. Now the point is that what I would like, you know, we want to give some structure on L2. We are trying to understand the geometry of the ball, difficult. Uh, the geometry of this, of this infinite dimensional space is difficult. Is it possible to make integration? One of the, uh, one of the structures most useful in, in analysis is to make, to construct measures, measures so that you can integrate, you can take, make probability, you can do whatever. Eh? And now this implies that mu is identically 0. Hmm? Can you see this? Can you see this? And of course, if, of course, if this is true, then there is an interesting point here. There cannot be a measure in the sense that we are usually use it integration, we integrate, we split the integral. All properties of the measure that we use comes from. But if this is true, then we cannot. So the point is either, so if you want to make integration in L2, and so essentially stochastic analysis, eh? probability and so on, we have to weaken some. We have to decide which of these assumptions is too strong. OK? So this is maybe not related to, to our discussion in functional discourse, but maybe something of interest for having a more global picture in infinite dimensions. So why this is true? It's very easy because you take the measure of the ball. The measure of the ball is finite, the big ball, B, BR. But the ball contains a finite an accountable number of disjoint ball of the same radii. Hmm? Now, the measure is increasing with, I mean, I have not written here, but the measure is increasing. If the sets increase, the volume increase. So now, the measure, the form, the measure of the ball is certainly larger than the measure of the union of this, these small balls, disjoint. So bigger or equal than the measure of the all B uh, R over uh, 2 square root of 2 Y N. Hmm? Is it OK for you? No problems? So I have the big ball. The measure of the big ball. The, the big ball contains a countable mm -hmm. ball, number of balls, all these joints. So the measure of the big ball is surely larger than the measure of the union of the balls, because they are contained. But then they are disjoint also. 
And therefore, since now they are disjoint, it is a property that the measure of the union is the sum of the, of the measures. OK? B R 2 square root of 2 Y N. Clear. Now, uh, these balls are one translated of, of the other. They are constructed by translation, as you can see. Therefore, by this property, they have always the same mu. Because they are one translated of the other. Therefore, this number is a constant. Huh? Well, it's a constant, but you see, uh, then this diverges, unless this constant is 0. <laughs> so if you want to give a finite, uh, so either the measure of all these small balls is 0, uh, and therefore the measure is 0, or, this is or the measure of the big ball is plus infinity, which is uh, a contradiction with this. No, I mean, this is a rough statement. It says that I am assigning 0 to the measure of any ball, essentially. Because I'm, so the claim is, the, the hypothesis is that the measure of a ball is finite. But then if it, and, and positive, say also. If it is positive and finite, then necessary actually is 0. Huh? So we have this assumption. Huh? Then, okay, but we will get that any ball has the measure zero, but it doesn't Okay, any ball, so, so change the thesis. Any ball has measure zero. Okay? No, okay, on any ball. Which is, uh, which is say, something which is strange from the point of view of the volume. And so now, you have this, well, you have to decide uh, what uh, what you want to do, which of if you want to construct. Uh, so f from this observation, there is starting point of the famous Gaussian measure. So actually, it is possible to construct a measure in infinite dimension, leading to a lot of properties in probability and so on. Which uh, and and what do you, I mean? What do you we can is this assumption here. So people prefer to renounce, I mean, to not to assume that you have translation invariance. OK? So I don't want to say anything more than this, just to let you know that one cancels essentially this assumption. Hmm? Once you, re re you don't have this assumption, then you cannot you cannot say that this is a constant. If it is not a constant, then you can make it a converging. And OK, now, uh, so now we have understood that we have two, two, a, a small number, two, two small number of compact sets with respect to the strong topology. Now I will use a new word. Strong topology means the topology induced by the distance. OK, so from now on, the strong topology is the topology is the induced by D on L2. Hmm? the natural one. But then this is too strong because there are, is, this, the number of compact sets is too small because they, any compact set has empty interior. OK, so now we weaken a little bit. So, so definition, let uh, Xn be a sequence of L2. C 
sequence in L2, uh, we say that, and, and let x in the point of L2, we say that xn, that xn converges, <coughs> converges weakly to x. And we write, usually in the books, sometimes one finds the following uh, way of writing, just only half arrow, <laughs> just only half. So, or, or, uh, hmm? maybe this is another notation. The, the, the symbol W here stands for weekly. On the other hand, the, sim the symbol stands for strong. This is in the, in the sense of the distance, strong and weak. OK, just notation. We say that um, Xn converges weakly to X if Xn against Y, a scalar product with Y, converges as a number as a real number, uh, uh, to xy for any y in L2. So this is a, another notion of convergence. OK? Remark. If xn converges weakly to x, then it converges for the product topology. For any k. And these actually are numbers. So pay attention to the notation. Eh? This xn is a sequence. So uh, when I use this symbol, this is a sequence of sequences. Any xn is, is a sequence. It's a vector with infinite many entries. OK, so pay attention to this. Because with the small symbol, there is something complicated behind. OK? By the way, is this clear? Yes. Why is this clear? Well, I don't want to talk about orthonormal basis because there is the existence of an orthonormal basis is non-trivial in infinite dimensions. It's true, uh, in a small L2, but when you use, we have to be careful. The word basis in, a, in infinite dimension is a complicated object. There are Hilbert basis, Schauder basis, Hamel basis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> So it is better for the moment to skip the point of the basis, as well as skip the definition of dimension for the moment. But, but you can take this zero, zero, zero. Exactly. I mean, it is just enough to take this element, which is, by the way, an element over 2. 0, 0, 0, 1 at the height position, 0, 0, 0. Hmm? 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. And then I test Xn against this EI. And this gives me EK. Yeah, sorry. And this gives exactly the K component. Is it OK? As a Y, you take each EK. Is it, do you? So indeed. Take y equal ek equal 0, 0, 1, 0. This is k position. With this choice of test y, of, or vector y, uh, we, we, we obtain this. Hmm? Remark.
And maybe another remark that we can do before. Me, um, uh, so, uh, exercise. If Xn converges strongly to X, then uh, then Xn. Well, this is also converges to X. Not only this, but also it converges weakly. And Xn converges weakly to X. C can we prove this? How should you prove? How would you prove, for instance, that uh, if I have strong convergence, I have convergence of the norms? Hmm? Strong convergence is convergence in between. Strong convergence is the, the, the convergence is the in the distance of the space. This is strong convergence. Okay. Yeah, because we have this inequality, remember, we have xn minus x, because the distance is Lipschitz. It's continuous, in fact. Hmm? So remember, the distance between two elements in a Hilbert space is the, is the norm of the difference. We, we are in a... In, in a, in a vector space, huh? so 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 that the, this it is true. And then, so if the right hand side converges to zero, the left hand side converges to zero. Is it is it clear? Okay. Fine. So this is immediate. Now, uh, how can I prove this? That actually, strong convergence implies weak convergence. Well. Yeah, yeah, just take the, so I have to show, what do I have to show? This. So what do I do? I take the difference between this and this. Okay? And so I take xn minus y minus xy, which by the, by the linearity of the scalar product with respect to the first variable is just this. Huh? Do you agree? Now, I have proven the Schwarzfelder inequality. Schwarz, sorry, the Schwarz inequality. No? Cauchy, sorry, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And uh, therefore, we have xn minus x rho dot y. Now, this y is an element of the space. Therefore, it's finite norm. So this is a finite number. And this is going to zero. Product is going to zero. Hmm? Is it okay? It's clear? Okay. So at least we have a convergence, say, which is weaker than the strong convergence. Now we would like to know. Uh, well, as we will see, we cannot hope that, uh, so it, it, mm, in general, x con n converges weakly to x does not imply so weak, does not imply this. And this we will see. Because we will prove actually that the sequence of centers of the ball that the balls that we have considered uh, uh, before 
we know it has no converging, has no strongly converging subsequence, right? But it will have weakly converging subsequence. Uh, However, if we reach the assumptions, so this we will prove it is not it is not in general true. So weak convergence, this is a big problem. I mean, in functional analysis, it is always very useful <clears throat> if you will continue in the study of PDE and functional analysis, you will several times have the problem that you would like to have a sequence of solutions of something, sequence of something, strongly convergence. And you always have weakly convergence. <laughs> you don't know how to improve the convergence from weak to strong. This is really a common problem, people working in functional analysis. Because once you have strong convergence, you are able to pass to the limit in several expressions. But if you have just only weak convergence, you cannot really pass to the limit. So. Uh, Remember that weak convergence very often is not enough to conclude arguments, okay? However, if we know something more, so weak and also something intermediate, can we conclude that Xn converges strongly? This, this Y in Hilbert space, eh? in L2, how we conclude this, <coughs> sorry. Uh, can we conclude this? Yes. What do we do? So let us take the difference. We have to show that this converges to zero, right? This we have to show this, okay? That this converges to zero. However, this is a scalar product. So we can split xn square plus x square minus two x n x. Hmm? So you see, the, the exercise is organized exactly so that this will converge to 0. Why? <laughs> because this, by assumptions, converges to x squared. OK? This, OK, is x squared. Then this is true for any y, right? In L2, sorry. This is true for any y. In particular, for y equal to x, x is an element of the space. Therefore, this converges to xx. So this, this is equal to x squared. And this converges to xx, which is twice the square norm. And therefore, this is equal to 0. Hmm? OK, so remember that so uh, at the end, the conclusion, strong implies weak. Weak does not imply strong. Strong implies convergence of the norms. And convergence of the norms plus weak implies strong. OK? This is, for the moment, the situation. Uh, actually, this situation is very general. It's not only true for L2. At the end, you, if you look at the Brzee's book of functional analysis, you will find more, much more general statements on, on this. Okay. So if everything is clear, we can continue. So well, what it is not easy maybe is to imagine what is weak convergence. Can you? Is somebody have some geometric hints on on this? No, strong is easy. It's convergence in the distance. 
you have a metric space. I think that everybody you know, of us can understand what is strong convergence, even in infinite dimensions, right? The distance of the, between the two points goes to zero. <coughs> the distance has the triangular property. The ball is convex. I mean, it's not so bad. But what does it mean, this geometrical? It's not easy for me, at least for me. I mean, uh, how can you imagine this? Well, it is more easy to imagine what is product of all, what is uh, convergence of co uh, coordinates. What does it mean? It means you have a sequence, you project on a fixed coordinate, and then the projections converges. Xk. Xkn converge. But this is true for any k. For all projections on the orthogonal, uh, on, the, say, no, I'm, on the axis, if there are axes, I mean, <laughs> OK? But this is something more. So you're not only projecting on, uh, on the coordinates. You are projecting even on, uh, on any, not, not only on the coordinate axis, but you're projecting on any direction of the infinite dimensional space, which is not so easy, no? at least. If, if you have some intuition more than this, remark. Uh, such a convergence, well, one should show, first of all, now I don't know if we will show, maybe yes, maybe, well, it's, it's rather easy. Well, w once you have a notion of convergence, it would be very nice to have the uniqueness of the limit. Hmm? Usually, uh, so it is possible to show, we will show maybe, that if the sequence weakly converges to x, then x is unique. There is only one weak limit, not two or three. <coughs> okay, so uniqueness of weak limit is something that one should prove. First remark. Second remark is that, <coughs> well, um, Do you know, in general, in topology, uh, what is related to uniqueness of the limit in general? If you have a topology, say, uh, then you take a sequence converging in that topology, when you can ensure that the, when the topology is Hausdorff. Hmm? So when two points have these joint neighborhoods, right? In this case, you, you, are, you are sure that, uh, that the limit is unique. And this is true also for the weak topology. So it is possible to show that this concept actually comes from a topology. The neighborhoods are not so easy. But the topology is Hausdorff. So the topology inducing weak convergence is Hausdorff topology. And you will find these statements in the Brezis book, for instance if you want, so that you can ensure uniqueness of the weak limit. The convergence is very weak, but at least still we have uniqueness. Of course, a too weak convergence could have more than one limit. But this is weak, but not too weak, so that still, fortunately, there is just one weak limit. <laughs> OK? <laughs> this is the, so then. Then another remark, maybe, that is useful. So consider, given y in L2, we can consider the following, uh, the following um, linear, the following linear uh, map, following linear functional. Hmm? So given y, you fix a projection direction, say, somehow, y. 
And then you consider the following map. The map that at any x into L2, it associates this number, scalar product between x and y. Hmm? What is weak convergence? Weak convergence makes this map continuous. Hmm? By definition. Namely, if xn weakly converges to x, then ly xn converges to ly of x, by definition. Is this clear? Hmm? So we have, uh, with the weak convergence topology, we are making continuous an infinitely many number of linear maps. Oh, a joint is a, is, a, is a word that for the moment is mysterious. Why you say a joint? There is, uh, yeah, there is no duality. I have never, I have never, I have carefully avoided the word dual for the moment. I will, I will use it, of course. But uh, the, the, my effort is to make things as simple as possible, avoiding, then, of course, at some moment we will have the dual. So, um, <coughs> I'm just only saying that this convergence implies that the family of Ly is a family of continuous, linear continuous. It's a family of linear continuous maps. Maps. This is so. Once I know that that I'm making continuous, I enforce continuity by hands. Eh? I make continuous by hands all these linear maps for any y. It's a lot of a lot of maps. And indeed, actually, the weak topology is exactly the topology, the natural topology, which makes continuous that family of so you can reverse the argument and define weak topology as the maybe the how do you call the coarsest topology which makes these families continuous hmm? so, uh, people working in topology knows this kind of topologies very well uh, is it clear so um, um, I have made I have chosen the, the opposite route I mean I have defined a weak convergence. I end up observing that with this convergence, I'm making continuous all these kind of linear maps. This is immediate from the definition. Clear? Usually, in more advanced books, you find what is the weak topology is the coarsest topology, which makes this family of linear map continuous. OK? And then, at the end, this is this. It's nothing else than this. Okay. So this is the remark. And then finally, sorry for all this long introduction. Maybe useful for understanding. So as you see, all difficulty starts from the example of the bolts. And. Uh, And therefore, now we, may, we, we observe that this is the good, the right notion of convergence because it gives us compactness that we, we don't have for strong topology. Therefore, now you can expect, I mean, the following theorem. So let xn be 
be bounded. Hmm? Then it admits Xn admits a weakly converging subsequence. A weakly converging subsequence. Okay. So to an element, yes, converging to an element, uh, com uh, converge to x and then two. Now, why this, this, this is a fundamental result? Because we know that, what does it mean xn to be bounded? Bounded means bounded in the strong topology, the topology of the distance. It means that xn belongs to the ball of some radius r centered at some point z. Hmm? This means bounded object contained in some ball. Hmm? But we know that uh, this is not strongly uh, sequentially compact, relatively compact. So it does not have, in general, a strongly converging subsequence. But it has a weakly converging subsequence. So concretely, concretely, you always find the following assertion. Take a family of functions which is bounded in the strong norm. Hmm? Then it admits a weakly converging subsequence. Not a strongly, but a weakly. So you have some limit. Is it okay? Okay. Is it okay? Or not? Is it okay or not? So let me remember once more, recall once more. I have a bounded sequence. This in general has not a strongly converging subsequence theorem of yesterday, example of the ball, center of the balls. But it has always a weakly converging subsequence. You will find such a kind, so you will, have, uh, this is a very general result in any Hilbert space. Well, in L2 for the moment for us. Okay, now, now the proof. What is our assumption? Our assumption is that there exists k positive such that it, this belongs to a big ball hmm? for any n. Okay, so we have this bound. This is our starting, this the only starting point of the proof. What we know is just only this. Boundedness in some norm, in this norm. From this bound, we, are, we have to be able to extract something, weakly converging to something. Huh? This is, so, and, and now we start, again, what, what at least, can, we can infer from this. We can infer something on the components, right? Because this is the sum k to 1 infinity square root. Maybe it would be better to use k square. No. Yeah. OK, x n k square. So it is immediate, therefore, that for any k, this number is less than or equal. Oh, sorry, k. There are too many k's. So let me use another, let me use i. OK? Too many k's. This is capital K. This is my i, i. OK, so now for any i, for any component, this is k. Uh, fixing, fixing 
i, we have that this is true for any n. Uh, and, and therefore, consider i equal to 1. So we, we, we use the standard, as, as you will recognize in a moment, the standard diagonal argument. And so, uh, so consider x and 1, this sequence. So this is uh, a sequence of real numbers in a bounded set. So it admits a converging subsequence that I call uh, that I call n1 a sequence of indices. This is a sequence of indices such that, uh, like yesterday, I hope uh, the notation this converges to x1 with x1 less than equal to k along that subsequence. Okay. Now I'm considering the sequence x2 and one, huh? and therefore I have a new subsequence n two contained in n one, subsequence of n one, such that x two n two converges to some x two with x two less than or equal than k. Now this can be done. for any for any k so that uh, uh, my notation is x i n k small k converges to xi for any i, for any k, small k for any i less than or equal than k. Huh? So I do this k number of times, finite number of times. I extract k subsequence one from the other. And so for all components less than or equal than k, I have convergence along that common subsequence. Using a diagonal argument, I can do this a countable number of times so that I have, uh, there exists a sequence of indices, of indices that now for simplicity, I still denote by n. So I extract a countable number of subsequences as so there is a sequence of indices still denoted by. We already made yesterday this kind of argument such that xi n converges to xi for any, uh, for any i in n. Okay? And for any i, xi is less than or equal to capital K. Do you agree? By a diagonal argument. Diagonal argument. Okay. Remark. We, we have by assumption that uh, the sum of x i n from i from 1 to infinity square is less than or equal than k square, right? This is our fundamental assumption. In particular, what is finite is the <coughs> truncated sum. Hmm? For any L. Therefore, passing to the limit here, I can erase the N because a very finite sum. And so, uh, This implies passing to the limit as n, as n along the sequence n that, uh, that I have extracted. Along this new sequence, uh, I can pass to the limit in this finite sum as n goes to infinity. 
And therefore, I can put xi here. Eh? So the sum for 1 to L xi square is less than or equal than k. This is true for any L, and k is independent of L. And therefore, I, I find also that the sum from i to 1 to infinity xi square is less than or equal than k, namely Sorry, k squared, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, sorry. And therefore, x has finite norm. So, so as, as yesterday, I mean, uh, we, 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 we find convergence for the product topology. Our bound on, uniform bound on the norms of xn gives that x also is bounded in the norm, and therefore the element is at least in L2. Okay? What remains to show is that actually, so we have a candidate, but the convergence for the moment is too weak because it's just convergence of the components. Now we have to project on all transverse, non-coordinate non, non directions, why? To have weak convergence. Mm -hmm. So it remains to show it remains to show that xn converges weakly to x, that is xn minus x y converges to 0, that is for any y in L2 y converges to 0. This we have to show. Okay? Now for any z in L2, let me, and then, and for any m in n, I introduce a, a symbol, which is the tail, the tail, so the tail of, of, of z, in the sense that uh, tau, the tail of z is equal to 0, 0, 0, and then uh, z, z, m plus 1, z, m plus 2, etc. This is the tail. So I cut the first important part of z, and I keep from m plus 1, I think, m plus 1, yes, and not m, m plus 1. My notation is this. Yes, OK. So now let us write xn minus xy, which is the product, the sum, sorry. Let me use the symbol i from 1 to infinity, uh, I fix m, from 1 to m, so fix m and fix, so fix m and fix y. And so now I have x and i minus x i y i plus sum uh, from i from m plus 1 infinity uh, maybe maybe this is already simpler writing tau mx n minus tau mx y. Hmm? Scalar product. Okay. 
Do you agree? Because this is zero before, so I have already written here all the first m terms of the sum. The next m terms, m, uh, the, the terms after, after m are these. So it is this, because this is zero before, before, before m. Okay? So now I can evaluate the uh, absolute value. And I have xn minus x absolute value less than or equal than. Let, let, now I take, uh, well, let us start for the moment writing just this in the absolute value. Now I want to control the tails for the moment. So uh, y. Now concerning the tails, what can I do is that I can write Schwarzelder and do this. Why? So remember now why is fixed, eh? Why does not move? Why is fixed? And then I have this by Schwarz, um, by Cauchy Schwarz, sorry, Cauchy Schwarz. Okay. Well, I can, but maybe it is not. Um, at the, I could write, nothing changes. But also with this y is okay, right? Because I'm multiplying by zero. So I can use tau m of y, I can use y is whatever you want. If you want, I can put tau m of y. So that this becomes uh, tau m of y. OK. Now I have to say something about this, saying that this is maybe finite or uniformly bounded. And then something on this, OK? So what can I say? Y is fixed. So Y is fixed, and therefore, since Y is fixed, I can choose an index. Let me call it, uh, I don't know, index. Uh, no, I don't. So, so fix epsilon positive, take m in n, so that this is very small. What does it mean, very small? It means that, no. no before doing this, maybe I, I, I bound again this with the sum of the, of the norms. Huh? So please, and now I do this, plus this is less than or equal than this plus tau m of xn plus tau m of x, and then still multiplied by the same object, tau m of y. OK, I do this. OK, so less than or equal, same sum, plus, and then I put the plus here, OK, plus of the norms. Now, what can I say about tau m of x? Well, this is surely less than k. No? Because x itself is less, is as normal, less than k. So this first, now remember, x. Here it is written that the square norm of x is less than k squared. OK, so this is less than k, right? But this is also less than k, because we have the uniform bound. Our assumptions say this is less than k, and this is less than k. So I can continue this inequality with the, so I have uh, fixing y and m also. I have this xn minus x y less than or equal than the sum up to m of what? Of x y n minus x y y y norm. Then that we control in a moment. But this is equal to 2k 
the, the tail of y, but y is fixed. So I can choose now, no, okay, so I have this, okay, now I fix epsilon and take m, fix epsilon, take m, so that essentially this becomes less than uh, epsilon over 2, okay, so that say 2, uh, so epsilon divided by 2k, uh, sorry, 2k, the sum from m plus 1 to infinity y k square 1 half is less than epsilon over 2. Say epsilon just for simplicity, OK? Epsilon. I can do this because, as I said, k is the big constant uniform bound that we have at the beginning, OK? Then uh, y is fixed, it's not moving, it does not depend on anything, this, that's the most important part. So th this, this says that I can take, uh, for given y, fixing epsilon, fixing y, we can take m large enough so that this is less than, than epsilon. We, can, we take that m. Hmm? Epsilon over 2. Okay. So this part of the tails are under control. Therefore, that becomes less than or equal than y square sum up to m x i n minus x i square once more uh, schwarz and cauchy schwarz uh, plus epsilon okay Now, well, still n is free. Still n is free. So um, now I can choose uh, n large enough. Now this is a finite sum. So I can choose n bar. Now we remember that xi n is converges to xi for any i. And so now I adjust a finite sum. Epsilon is fixed. M is fixed. Y is fixed. Now I can choose capital N. Choose capital N. So choose N bar such that Y and this sum to the half xi n minus xi square is less than or equal than epsilon for any n bigger than capital N bar. Huh? And therefore, at the end, what do we find? We find that this, huh, that for any epsilon, there exists a capital N bar such that this is less than 2 epsilon. Is it clear? Sorry for all this, uh, for all n, epsilon, delta, etc., etc. Uh, okay. So let me repeat. Given epsilon positive, I found n bar such that this is less than 2 epsilon, epsilon plus epsilon, for any n larger than n bar. And this concludes the proof of weak convergence of a subsequence obtained by a diagonal argument. Okay.